Okay, so uh, maybe we'll begin. Um, so welcome back everyone to the final talk of the afternoon session. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Mina Aganajic talking about not categorification and mirror symmetry. So take it away. All right, so I, I wanna thank the organizers for putting together, for keeping the conference going in these, in these difficult times. Um, okay, so um, in this talk, I'll describe how mirror symmetry solves the problem of categorifying quantum link invariance. The problem was introduced in 98 by Kovanov, who showed how to associate to a link a collection of bi-graded vector spaces. They're graded by uh, homological grading um, and, an and an equivariant grading, such that um, the equivariant Euler character uh, is the joints polynomial. And the vector spaces themselves are link invariants. The problem Kovanov initiated is to find a physical or at least a geometric meaning of Kovanov homology, one that works uniformly for all gauge groups. Uh, in 88, Edward Witten explained that Jones polynomial comes from Trent-Simons theory with gauge group um, based on uh, Lie algebra S32 with effective Trent-Simons level related to the variable um, Q um, of the Jones polynomial. This plays the Jones polynomial in a more general framework, which uh, one gets by considering true Simon's theory based on different Lie algebras and um, their presentations. Now, um, the relation of Witten's link invariance to quantum groups was developed a year later by um, Shetikin and Turai. Um, I'll explain that Kovanov's uh, homologies also have uh, origin in physics, which places them into more general framework in parallel to what Witten did in 88. The theory, uh, in fact, has two uh, different descriptions related by a version of two-dimensional homological mirror symmetry. Uh, it's solvable explicitly um, by making homological mirror symmetry manifest. The two-dimensional physics enters here because the descriptions we will get come from uh, two-dimensional theories associated to link times time in R3 times time. Um, in fact, these theories come out of string theory, and the way they come out of string theory um, they're naturally equipped to describe uh, arbitrary links in R2 uh, times S1 times time, not just R3 times time. The theories we'll end up with uh, describe two dimensional defects of the six dimensional zero two theory as anticipated in the works of Ugur and Bafa and Gokov Schwartz and Bafa. The approach we'll take here is complementary to that um, developed by Witten in that it describes the same physics just from perspective of the defects rather than um, the bulk six dimensional or five dimensional theory. Um, now, while string theory played a crucial role in discovering the structure that, I, that I'll tell you about, the final answer does not depend on understanding it. Um, one of the striking aspects of quantum knot invariance is the wealth of math and physics connections that one gets to discover uh, once you understand. The fact that this structure arises from a deeper theory will, will I think, lead to many more connections. We'll see one of them here uh, to a vast new family of examples of homological mirror symmetry, which connected to representation theory. In the same 89 paper, uh, Witten also showed that underlying Trent-Simons theory is two-dimensional conformal field theory um, associated with, um, with affine Lie algebra symmetry. We'll take this rather than Trent-Simons theory as the starting point. To eventually get invariance of knots uh, in R3, uh, one typically starts with the Riemann surface, which is a complex plane with punctures. It's equivalent, but for our purposes better, um, to take the Riemann surface to be a punctured infinite cylinder. This way, the theory will be able to describe links in R2 times S1, not just R3. To a punctured at finite point, uh, we'll associate a finite dimensional representation of the Lie algebra, which uh, we'll take to be minuscule. To punctures at two ends at infinity, uh, we'll associate a pair of Vermont module um, infinite dimensional representations was uh, highest weights and not integral. So this data, uh, conformal field theory associates a conformal block obtained by su suing chiral vertex operators, which um, act as intertwiners between uh, pairs of Riemann modular representations. Now, rather than characterizing conformal blocks in terms of vertex operators and suing, 
One can um, also describe them as solutions to a differential equation. The equation um, that I solve is uh, a trigonometric version of the equation discovered by Knizhnik and Zemological in 84, because the Riemann surface is an infinite cylinder. By um, varying positions of vertex operators as a function of time, we get a colored braid in three-dimensional space. From perspective of the KZ equation, the braiding matrix is the monodromy matrix along the path in parameter space described by the braid. The monodromy problem uh, was solved um, for the KZ equation, was solved um, by Drinfeld in 89 and Kazan and Lustig following earlier works of uh, Tsuchiya, Kanye, and Kwanu uh, in special cases. So they show that monodromy matrix that reorders a neighboring pair of vertex operators um, of the affine current algebra is an R matrix of the quantum group uh, associated to G, whose construction is canonical. A any link can be represented as a closure of some braid. The corresponding quantum link invariant is a matrix element of the braiding matrix taken between pairs of conformal blocks, which correspond to the top and the bottom. The caps and the cups that you need to close off the braid describe vertex operators uh, that come together um, uh, colored by complex conjugate representations, which come together and disappear. In this way, both braiding and fusion of conformal field theory plays an important role in the story. Our starting point for categorification is realization of conformal blocks, which comes from quantum field theory in two dimensions, with n equals to two supersymmetry. The right theory is ultimately uh, picked out by string theory. We'll specialize um, G to be a simply laced, so it's of AD type. There is a generalization to non simply laced Lie algebras, but it, it's more involved, so we won't describe it here. One description of the theory um, we'll get is as a supersymmetric sigma model with hyperkähler target, which is a very special manifold. This manifold um, can be described as um, moduli space of singular G manifolds with prescribed Dirac singularities. G here is the Lie group of adjoint type with Lie algebra little g. To every vertex operator, uh, we place a singular monopole at a corresponding point in R, where we break up R3 into R times C. Uh, the charge of this monopole is the highest weight of the LG representation coloring the vertex operator. The charges of singular monopole uh, determine um, the, the representation that conformal blocks transform in. The weight in that representation determines the total monopole charge, um, including that of smooth monopoles. The monopole moduli space is parameterized in part by positions of the smooth monopoles on R3, keeping those of singular monopoles fixed. Now, our manifold uh, has several other useful descriptions. One familiar to mathematicians is as a resolution of a certain transversal slice in a fine Grassmannian of G. Um, the labels here uh, encode the singular monopole charge and the order the monopoles appear on the line and where nu is a total monopole charge. To physicists, X is a Coulomb branch of a certain three-dimensional quiver gauge theory with n equals to four supersymmetry where Singular and smooth monopoles determine the total uh, ranks of the quiver um, gauge and flavor symmetry groups. Uh, the manifold um, is hyperkähler. The positions of singular monopoles um, are modular of its metric. If all representations are minuscule um, and the positions of singular monopoles uh, are generic, our manifold is smooth. Um, the complexified Kähler modula of X is positions of singular monopoles on an infinite cylinder. The Riemann surface A from the beginning, uh, we took it to be a cylinder rather than a plane because B fields that pair with real Kähler moduli uh, to complexify them are periodic. Um, we'll choose all of our singular monopoles to be at the origin of the complex plane of uh, the complex plane in R3. Um, by doing that, our manifold has a symmetry corresponding to scaling of the holomorphic symplectic form. We'll work equivariantly with respect to that 
And also with this, with this respect to a, a larger torus of symmetries um, where lambda action preserves the holomorphic symplectic form and encodes Verma module weights. This action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form breaks the supersymmetry from n equals to four to n equals to two and introduces the Q variable in our problem. Um, conformal blocks arise as partition fun functions of the supersymmetric sigma model um, uh, from a cigar, infinite cigar, to X, working equivariantly with respect to this large torus. Um, so as I said, we'll think about um, the domain curve as an infinite cigar with a circle boundary at infinity. In the interior of the cigar, supersymmetry is preserved by uh, an A-type twist. And at infinity, we'll place a B-type boundary condition. Because the cigar is um, uh, infinitely long, uh, A-type supersymmetry preserved in the interior is compatible with any supersymmetry on the boundary, even of B-type. From perspective of X, uh, a KZ equation is what's called a quantum differential equation. It's an equation for flat sections of a connection on a vector bundle with five vertical homology groups, all with a complex fat KLM moduli introduced by Gimental. The fact that for our specific X, the two coincide is um, a recent theorem of Ivan Danielenko, who's a postdoc at Berkeley. Um, one gets different solutions to the quantum differential equation and to the KZ equation by choosing different beta brains as boundary conditions at infinity. These boundary conditions form a category, and the category of boundary conditions for the sigma model on X, preserving B type supersymmetry and working equivariantly with respect to uh, T, is known as the Dirac category of T equivariant coherence use. If we pick a B type brain, an object of our category, as a boundary condition in infinity, the supersymmetric partition function computes um, what's known as Givental's J function, or sometimes called the vertex function, defined by um, T equivariant Gromov Witten theory of X. It depends on the brain only through its um, equivariant K theory class. A braid um, has a geometric interpretation as a path in complexified KLM moduli that avoids similarities. Um, because Complexified KLM moduli are relative positions of vertex operators on A. <clears throat> it follows that uh, geometric realization um, of braiding on the space of conformal blocks is monodromy of the quantum differential equation along the path in KLM moduli. From the sigma model perspective, this monodromy problem arises by letting the moduli of the theory vary according to the braid in the neighborhood of the boundary at infinity, where the direction along the cigar coincides with the time along the braid. It follows that the path integral of the sigma model, where um, time runs along the on an annulus with time running along the annulus, and moduli that vary according to the braid, computes the matrix element of the monodromy matrix between pairs of conformal blocks fixed out by the beta brains at the two boundaries. The same path integral where the time runs around the circle computes the index of the supercharge preserved by the two brains. The index state is the same if we take all the variation to happen near one of the two boundaries at the expense of changing the boundary condition there. The braid group acts by derived autoequivalences um, since along a path in KLM moduli, the category of beta brain stays the same. The cohomology of the supercharge is computed by um, the derived category as its most basic ingredient, the space of morphisms between a pair of brains. The Euler characteristic of the theory um, just manifestly uh, computes where you close the, the, uh, close the strip up back into annulus manifestly com computes the monodromy matrix, since uh, we are free to think of either direction as time. It follows that um, this derived equivalence um, determined by the braid manifestly categorifies the monodromy matrix. This explains a very difficult theorem of Bezrakovnikov and Okunkov, which uh, uses quantization of uh, X in characteristic P. The, um, Quantum linking variants should also be categorified um, 
by um, coherent, derived category of coherent sheaves, since they can also be expressed as matrix elements of the braiding matrix between pairs of conformal blocks. For this, we first need to find objects of the derived category that serve as caps and cups. In looking for such objects, we'll discover that not only braiding, but also fusion has geometric, geometric interpretation in terms of X. As our manifold develops, um, our manifold develops singularities as a pair of singular monocles approach each other. Um, the singularities uh, come from cycles in X that collapse at the corresponding wall in Kaling moduli. The collapsing cycles uh, turn out to be labeled by representations that occur in the tensor product because singularity in the monopole moduli space is associated to monopole bubbling. The highest weight um, of um, the representation in the tensor product is a charge of a single singular monopole that's left behind after some smooth monopoles bubble off. This reflects the fact that from conformal field theory perspective that as a pair of vertex operators approach, one gets a new natural basis of conformal blocks, which are um, labeled by the representations and the tensor product, and moreover, which are eigenvectors of braiding. The brains uh, that correspond to cups turns, turn out to be um, geometric. They are actual sheaves supported in a vanishing cycle in X, which um, corresponding to a given minuscule representation is the associated minuscule Grassmannian. Um, these brains are turn out to be eigensheaves of braiding whose vertex functions are conformal blocks that describe these caps. Um, to understand why this is the case, um, the origin um, in the sigma model to X of the braiding functor comes from variations of stability conditions on the derived category defined with respect to central charge, which is a close cousin of conformal blocks but distinct from them. Um, like conformal blocks, it can be computed in principle by gromov witten theory, um, except with no insertions at the origin. I didn't tell you they were there, but they are. Where in addition, one turns off the equivariant parameters. So we get a map from ordinary K theory um, of X to C that depends only on KLM modulo. Um, the stability condition um, uh, derived with respect to the central charge is known as the pi stability condition discovered by Douglas. In our case, X is hypercalar. Once we turn off equivariant parameters, which we do to define Z, Z naught, um, because of that, the exact central charge can be read off from classical geometry. You don't need gromov witten theory. And correspondingly, the stability structure it gives rise to is extremely simple. It's constant in a chamber in KLM moduli corresponding to keeping um, the order of vertex operators fixed and changes when a pair of them trade places. So the theory at hand should give model examples of original stability condition. It's simple because X is hypercalar. Um, near a wall in KLM moduli, we get vanishing cycles corresponding to ways of fusing um, pairs of vertex operators and objects of the derived category whose central charge vanishes as a dimension of the vanishing cycle. Now, conformal blocks which diagonalize action of braiding um, do not in general come from actual objects of the derived category. The eigenshifts of braiding uh, on which a braiding functor X just by um, degree shifts are extremely rare. What you get instead is a filtration of the derived category by order of vanishing of the central charge, of the pi stability central charge, with terms in the filtration labeled by distinct representations in the tensor product. Because our starting representations are minuscule, all representations are distinct. In fact, one gets a pair of such filtrations one on each side of the wall, and the wall corresponds to simply a reordering of singular monopoles on this real line. Crossing the wall um, preserves the filtration, but it has the effect of mixing up brains 
of a given order of vanishing of the central charge with those that um, vanish faster and um, which belong to lower orders in the filtration. On quotient subcategories, the derived equivalents, so only on quotient subcategories, the derived equivalents, uh, the derived equivalents act by degree shifts. But this degree shift depends only on the order of the filtration, um, not on, on the object, um, object, object themselves, and on the path around the singularity. And uh, the degree shifts you can read off from the equivariant central charge. You get the equivariant central charge, except instead of the ordinary, by simply working in equivariant realm of Witten theory and placing no insertions at the origin. So again, it's a cousin of conformal blocks, but more complex than the ordinary central charge Z0, and one for which you, need, you do need equivariant realm of Witten theory to compute. Anyhow, these are explicitly computable, um, these degree shifts. So you can um, describe the associated derived equivalence fairly explicitly. The derived equivalences of this very special structure uh, were envisioned by um, uh, uh, Roque and Chuang. Um, uh, but they, at the time, um, they had very few examples um, from geometry. They thought of this as the ways one should understand variations of bridging stability condition. So now here we find them explicitly. Um, the objects that correspond to cups belong to the very lowest term of the filtration. So they are necessarily eigenshifts of, of the braiding function. They have nothing to mix up with. Um, even so, they are extremely special. Um, they are special because for the same reason that identity representation is a very special representation. Now, using uh, very special properties of this perverse filtration, and the fact that, uh, and these, um, the geometric um, understanding of the brains that are caps as simply brains wrapping vanishing cycles, it's not hard to show that not only uh, do uh, homology groups manifestly uh, categorify the corresponding link invariants, they are themselves link invariants. The perverse filtration uh, vastly simpl simplify proofs of such things as, uh, for example, in the work of Kamnitzer and Kautis, um, which is why um, Roque and Chuan came up with them. <laughs> now, recently, Ben Webster proved that uh, link invariants that come from Rx are equivalent to uh, invariants that he defined in 2013 um, using um, KR, what I known as KRLW algebras. Uh, studied by Kovanov and Lauda, by Rokwe and, and himself. Now, as stated, neither the approach uh, by KRL double algebras nor um, by uh, derived categories of coherent sheaves on Rx is very computation friendly. In the rest of the talk, I'll, I wanna describe how physics lets you reformulate the problem and solve the theory. This resulting description is completely new. Our second description is based on the lambda gisberg model whose um, target is to first approximation, open subset of symmetric products of copies of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live with a certain potential. The relation between X we had so far and Y is a cousin of ordinary two-dimensional mirror symmetry. Mirror symmetry that relates them can't be ordinary because Y turns out to be half the dimension of the big X, of, of X. <laughs> um, instead, uh, moduli space of X we had so far, um, moduli space, which is a moduli space of monopoles or a Coulomb branch of some gauge theory, has uh, what I call a core locus, um, which is half dimensional and contains all the information about the geometry, whose mirror is Y. So right now we have two X's which um, look different, uh, but sound the same. So we'll call our original X, which is the moduli space of monopoles on R3, the big X and its core, which is half its dimension, the small X. So the small X is mirrored to, 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 to Y. Viewing uh, the big X as the moduli space of monopoles on R3, its core is a locus where all monopoles, singular or not, are at the origin of C and at points in R. This 
small x is preserved by the C-star action that scales the whole morphic simplex form and which introduces Q and breaks supersymmetry uh, from n equals to four. Um, since now, so now in principle, we have pairs of mirror symmetries relating the small x and yeah, small y and the big x and its mirror, the big y. So we'll call the small x, uh, we'll call the small x the equivariant mirror of the big x. So what I call equivariant mirror symmetry is this relation that goes diagonal. It's not simply a deformation of ordinary mirror symmetry. Uh, now, while the small x, so the, the structure of this is that the small x embeds into big as a whole morphic Lagrangian, half the dimension, while the big y fibers over the small y with whole morphic Lagrangian C star fibers, C star to the D fibers. Now, uh, since this isn't familiar, a model example to keep in mind is big X, which is a resolution of an AM minus one surface singular, a manifold familiar to all. Its core looks like um, a collection of P1s with a pair of infinite disks attached. Um, the big X in this case is a moduli space of a single smooth SO3 monopole in presence of M singular ones. Um, the ordinary mirror of the big X is the big Y, which is known as the multiplicative AM minus one surface with a potential which we won't need. Um, this multiplicative AM minus one surface is a C star vibration over an infinite cylinder. The fact that it's a cylinder rather than a plane is what makes this multiplicative. Anyway, Y is a vibration of, a, of an infinite cylinder, which is our Y with M marked points at the interior. And at those marked points, the C star fibers of the big Y over small degenerate. In the big Y, the M minus one Lagrangian spheres, which are mirrored to M minus one vanishing P1s in the big X. And the projection to small Y um, maps these to uh, uh, Lagrangians, which are simply intervals that begin at end in the punctures on the cylinder. Um, now, you, you will have noticed that the small y, in this case, is simply a single copy of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live. The positions, the, the marked points correspond to positions of vertex operators where the C star vibration degenerates. Now, by SYZ mirror symmetry, the small x, which looks like this um, infinite uh, sausage, and uh, y, share a common base, uh, which is uh, the moduli space of one smooth monopole on R in presence of M singular ones. More generally, the equivariant mirror of the big X and the ordinary mirror of its core is um, Y, which is um, a resolution of an open subset of symmetric product of copies of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live. Um, with um, certain singularities resolved. <clears throat> um, projecting um, to uh, the common SYZ base of X and of, y and of, of the small X and of small Y is the same as projecting the big X uh, to the, just the real, uh, which is the moduli space of singular monopoles on R times C to just the, the real line. Um, including uh, the equivariant T action um, corresponds to um, adding uh, to the sigma model on Y a specific potential, which is a multi-valued um, complex function. From the mirror perspective, conformal blocks are partition functions of the B-twisted theory on a very long cigar with a tie boundary condition at infinity. The a tie boundary condition is simply a Lagrangian in Y, the small y. Such amplitudes uh, have the following form, where omega here is a top holomorphic form on Y, the W is the lambda gisbert potential, and phi is the sum insertions of chiral ring operators. So what we are rediscovering here from mirror symmetry is integral formulation of conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra, which um, is known from works of Fagan and Frankel in the 80s and also Sheffman and Varchenko. Now, um, there is a reconstruction theory due to 
given to Alan Tellerman, which says that starting with a solution of quantum differential equation, one gets to reconstruct all genus topological string amplitudes of any semi-simple 2D field theory, any massive 2D theory, which R certainly is. Um, so thus, uh, the B-twisted lambda gisbert model and the A-twisted sigma model uh, to the big X, working equivalently with respect to T, are equivalent to all genus. So equivalent topological mirror symmetry, in this sense, cannot tell the dimension. Um, corresponding to the solution, to a solution of KZ equation is an A brain at the boundary of infinity, uh, as we said. This brain is an object of the category of A brains, which um, is for us the derived for Kaya silo category of Y with potential W. It's the category described by uh, Denis Ru yesterday. Um, um, the set, one needs to um, delete from, from Y, this uh, associated to this the collection of divisors F0, gives rise to a collection of one forms on Y with integer periods, which are responsible for introducing equivariant gradings of both brains and homes between them. This construction is not um, unfamiliar. It's not entirely unfamiliar, but it's not very explored. The pot uh, so anyway, the, pot the potential W here, uh, which as I said, is a multi-value holomorphic function, mirrors the equivariant um, action on X. And in particular, turning off the T equivariant action on small X kills W completely, sets it to zero. Now, mirror symmetry helps us understand exactly which questions uh, we need to ask to recover homological knot invariants from, uh, from Y, from small Y. Um, now, since small Y is an ordinary mirror of the small X, um, we should start by understanding how to recover homological invariants from small X instead of from big. We know how to do it from the big X, uh, I described this earlier, but now we'd like to know how to do it from the small X. Now, every B type brain on the big X, which is relevant for our problem, comes from a B type brain on its core via a functor that uh, simply inter interprets a brain on the small X um, as a brain on the big X. This functor that goes up has an, what's called an adjoint that goes the other way. The adjointness of these functors um, uh, means that given any pair of brains on the big X that come from the small X, the homes between them computed upstairs agree with the homes downstairs at the price of replacing one of the brains downstairs by a funny brain that you get by starting with the brain downstairs, sending it up, first up and then back down. So replacing F by this, F by, by this push pull brain. Um, okay, so um, the construction of these functors is standard on the B side. By mirror symmetry, for every pair of B type brains on the big X, which come from small X, there is a mirror pair of A brains on the small Y, which are mirrored to the brains on the small X, such that the homes between them on small y agree with those on the big X. This means that we can solve our categorification problem from the perspective of small y as well. Now, the factors that you need uh, here relate objects on the small y and the big y that mirrors what happens on the B side. This construction is somewhat novel um, it's joint work uh, with Michael McBreen and Vivek Chand. Now, recall our example. Um, the small y, which is equivariant mirror of the big X, which is an in surface. Now, uh, mirror to i vanishing p1 in the small x is, was a Lagrangian that's simply um, an interval between a pair of punctures on small y. The functor that goes up simply amounts to pairing the brain downstairs with circle fibers over it, which is how you get this picture. That one's actually familiar to many. Uh, the function that goes the other way doesn't send the vanishing sphere upstairs to, um, to an interval down 
Instead, computing it either from mirror symmetry or by its definition, um, by Lagrangian correspondences in the work with Shen, and Green, one finds a figure eight Lagrangian. Now, the basic virtue of eigen factors is that one ends up preserving the homes. Um, it's not difficult to see that this is indeed the case by just looking at intersections of upstairs and downstairs. Now, the example we just gave is relevant for carbon homology for a link obtained by closing a braid uh, with uh, two D strands, uh, the big X, that you need is a modular space of D smooth SO3 monopoles in presence of M singular ones, where M is 2D. Um, the same X, a big X, can in turn be described as um, an open subset of um, symmetric, uh, default symmetric product of copies of an A and minus one surface, more precisely of a Hilbert scheme of D points on the surface. Um, this is a theorem due to Manolescu. It's not an, um, an obvious fact. Now, um, in the big X, the brains, for th in this case, that close off the strands, in general, there's a minuscule gas minus. For this case, they're simply P1s. Um, they're actually collections of D non intersecting P1s. How many? Uh, as many as you need caps. Um, it's equivariant mirror is open subset of symmetric product or resolution thereof, um, uh, corresponding to a configuration of uh, D unordered points on the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live with marked points corresponding to where the vertex operators were with a potential that I write here explicitly. This is for S52, for the Jones point on that. Um, now by equivariant mirror symmetry, um, the D cups are products of D non-intersecting figure eight Lagrangians, while the D caps are D interval rings, products of D interval rings. In the Lana Ginsburg description, both the Lagrangians and the action of braiding are completely geometric. So in fact, we can simply start with a projection of a link to a surface, translate it into a pair of Lagrangians um, by choosing a bicoloring of the link, um, such that uh, one color always underpasses the other. <clears throat> and then um, the mirror Lagrangians are obtained by replacing all the blue segments by simple intervals and uh, all the red segments by figure eights. And uh, where the red and the blue meet is where the punctures are. By mirror symmetry, um, the homological link invariant is the space of morphisms between uh, the pair of brains. These spaces are a priori uh, defined by floor theory, um, modeled after most theory approach to supersymmetric quantum mechanics. <clears throat> um, there are other formulations of it, um, say uh, due to um, Gayotte Moore uh, um, and, and Witten. Um, this uses the standard floor theory approach on this described by um, Uru yesterday, or it suffices for this. Um, the starting point, uh, the starting point uh, for this is the floor complex spanned by intersection points of the two Lagrangians, graded by um, cohomological or um, um, Maslow uh, degrees and by equivariant degrees. In the floor theory approach to the A model, the action of the differential is obtained by counting Holomorphic disk instantons, interpolating uh, from one intersection of Lagrangians to another, a fermion number one, a Maslow index one, and equivariant degree zero. The degree should be um, equivariant degree should be zero simply for the map to be in Y to avoid the deleted loci. Um, in the absence of anomalies, the differential squares to zero, and the cohomology of the resulting complex is the space of exact ground states and the space of morphisms between the corresponding pair of brains in the derived category. In our case, this theory can be, in fact, described explicitly, thanks to the fact that um, it's a close cousin of an exactly solved theory known as um, the Hager-Floor theory. We would get Hager-Floor theory by replacing um, 
uh, Lie algebra, which is SU2, um, by GL1 slash 1. And floor theory leads to Alexander polynomial rather than domes. <clears throat> the Hegel floor theory has a target, which is um, an open also an open subset of symmetric product of D copies of the Riemann surface with a similar but different potential and a different deleted set. Um, the, these differences um, can be accounted for by um, thinking of Hegel floor theory, essentially, as a theory of fermions on the Riemann surface, whereas for SU2, you want anions. Anyway, one uh, guess to is none. Uh, what Hegel floor theory um, taught people to do is that in these symmetric product, for these symmetric product type targets, one can rephrase the A model, um, which a priori starts by um, studying maps uh, from into Y in terms of counting uh, holomorphic curves in the product of D times the Riemann surface uh, whose symmetric product is Y. Um, together um, with a pair of projections, one to D as a default cover and one to the Riemann surface A. Now this is known as um, the cylindrical approach to floor theory. Um, from perspective of um, A of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live um, and where we project our knots, uh, Lagrangians are simply products of D one dimensional Lagrangians on the Riemann surface. The intersection points are of the pair of Lagrangians are D tuples of intersections of one dimensional Lagrangians um, taken up to uh, perm permutation. So for example, um, here we have actually two, only two Lagrangians and um, eight intersection points between them. Anyway, so in, in this um, the holomorphic map from a disk to Y in this approach um, can be studied from perspective of the Riemann surface A. Uh, it projects with um, non-negative non multiplicities to domains on the Riemann surface A with boundaries on one-dimensional Lagrangians and vertices at intersection points. Now, as in Hager floor theory, um, one can read off from the domain uh, the fermion number and the equivariant degree of the map, um, except that the, the assignment is different than in floor theory. Um, so for example, um, the Maslow index of a disk um, that projects to such a shaded domain A is given in terms of the Euler characteristic of the domain and the counting the numbers of acute and obtuse angles. So this disk has Maslow index one. Um, this cylindrical approach to floor theory um, reduces the problem of counting holomorphic maps to this high dimensional space Y to a well-defined problem in complex analysis, one for each domain, A. Um, the solution of which um, amounts to hard exercises in Riemannian mapping theorem. Um, now, the, the fact that the differential squares to zero comes um, as usual to, um, from contributions to Q squared, canceling in pairs coming from broken maps, which are uh, boundaries of Maslow index two disks with equivariant degree zero. So here are examples of such. Um, so in this example that came from right handed Kofling, the eight intersection points, six domains that can in principle contribute to the differential. And um, <clears throat> the homology of the resulting complex, if you um, could count instantons, if you knew how, if you saw the Riemannian mapping problem, um, should be covenant homology of the right handed Kofling. Now, such counting problems are very difficult. Even in the Hager floor setting, one does not know how to do it directly on the nose for arbitrary map, for arbitrary disk instant Um, However, um, the dimension of the complex um, um, that you need um, is much, much smaller than uh, the dimension of the complex in, in covenant homology. It grows only polynomially with a number of crossings in the link, as opposed to exponential growth, which you always get in, in covenant case. Um, what's easy to do is to compute the Euler characteristic. Um, the Euler characteristic simply counts intersection points of Lagrangians, 
keeping track of gradings, um, the fact that this problem computes the Jones polynomial is in fact a theorem of Bigelow from the 90s. So we've explained his very peculiar um, approach to Jones polynomial. Now, the discounting problem, as I said multiple times, on the nose is very difficult. Um, however, it can be solved by making homological mirror symmetry that relates the small x and the small y um, and their derived categories manifest. This works uniformly for any simply lazy algebra. Um, now, Working with derived Foucaultian category as opposed to simply Foucaultian category is actually simpler. For one, the derived category has uh, far fewer objects because any deformation of frames that doesn't change the amplitudes is an equivalence. <clears throat> In particular, one can generate uh, the entire derived category by a finite set of brains, which are symbols of the potential. These also appeared in yesterday's talk. Um, for every critical point of the potential, we get a pair of left and right symbols, which are respectively the set of all initial conditions for upward or downward gradient flows of real part of W on which imaginary part of W is constant. The critical point equations here are a variant of Bayes equations um, with an irregular singularity um, at one end of the cylinder. Um, the solutions are isolated and non-degenerate and simply labeled by the weights um, of the weight space the conformal blocks transform in. Um, the set of symbols depends on the chamber in equivariant parameter space. There is a choice of chamber that's suggested by mirror symmetry in which the left symbols, one set of symbols, are all products of real line Lagrangians, um, which simply look like lines on the cylinder. These are suggested by mirror symmetry as mirror to vector bundles on X. To formulate homes between them, one has to deform the brains. Um, after the deformation, the intersection points become isolated. There are still infinitely many of them. They have to be because they're, um, the, the, they're mirror to um, vector bundles on, uh, on non-compact space. These symbols, generate an algebra. Um, the algebra um, is not simply a vector space, but you get, but it actually has products um, inherited from floor theory. <clears throat> now, in our case, something remarkable happens. It turns out that all the algebra elements have cohomological degree zero. We can compute these because we know how to compute mass of indices. In particular, this implies that the action of the differential is trivial. This is actually much simpler than Hager floor theory, which has a non-trivial differential. Now, this isn't an accident. It's a reflection of mirror symmetry, which maps the direct sum of all the left symbol brains to the tilting generator of the derived category of coherent sheaves on the small x. A provi mirror symmetry provides for us a construction of tilting generators, which is in in fact, uh, uh, not just on small x, but also on big, which is a very difficult problem in math in principle. Anyway, the algebra that we get is then an ordinary associative algebra uh, graded by covariant degrees. <clears throat> now, there are not many homomorphic discounts that one can evaluate explicitly, but it turns out all the ones that you need to compute the structure constants of this algebra um, are actually computable. They're computable because they come from products of triangles, um, which um, from domains which look like products of triangles on the, um, on the Riemann surface, which are in turn largely determined by the d equal to one theory. Um, now, so we can, act, we can actually compute exactly what this algebra is for any g. Um, since the symbols uh, generated the um, derived the Foucault saddle category, and everything there is to know about the symbols is contained in, in this algebra, we get an equivalence of uh, derived categories um, where uh, D sub A is the derived category of A modules, which you get from a functor that takes, uh, that takes any Lagrangian in Y into a module for the algebra A using uh, 
this tilting collection of timbals. Now, as an ordinary associative algebra, the algebra A can always be thought of as a path algebra of a quiver, uh, whose nodes are critical points um, of the potential, um, in our case labeled by the weights, and where paths from one node to another encode at homes between the symbols. Um, for us, so these are like statements many are familiar with that um, categories of B-type rings on some Calabiama and all the categories of, of quiver representations. What this says is that all these theories are exactly like that. It's, they're as simple as that, as, you know, brains on a conifold. okay. Uh, for us, these quivers always have closed loops. Um, so it, this results in a very rich representation theory and the richer derived category. <clears throat> um, um, Sorry to interrupt. For, uh, how much more time will you need? Maybe five. Oh, minutes? I just need a, a, like two minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, okay. For y, um, which so just to give you an example, for y, which is the equivariant mirror of the a minus one surface, um, the algebra a is simply path algebra of the familiar um, affine a and quiver with somewhat unfamiliar relations, and this algebra captures all the intersection points um, between the symbols and also the relations between them. The more familiar I find quiver arises, in fact, from B-type brains on the, on the big X, where um, this equivalence of the derived category of modules of this algebra and coherent sheaves is well known, uh, except that the relations for the big X are different. They are the familiar ones. If you instead impose this unfamiliar relation, it corresponds to re restricting the big X to the small X whose category of brains then becomes the category of modules of this algebra that came from the symbols. So in this way, homological mirror symmetry that relates the small x and the small y and their categories of brains becomes manifest. So this is a model of how, mirrors, uh, how homological mirror symmetry is understood more generally, as you saw in Aru's talk. Uh, so as I said, this algebra is computable explicitly for any g. It has flavors of the algebras that appeared in works of Kovanov, Lauda, Roque, and which Webster generalized. However, um, the algebra itself and the, link, the description of link invariants you get from it is far simpler. Um, it's simpler because it describes space half the dimension. Now, so what do we learn from this? The virtue of the, of the derived equivalence is that any brain, any Lagrangian has a, what's called a projective resolution as a complex, every term of which is a sum of symbol brains. The maps in, that makes this into a complex as opposed to direct sum are a prescription for how to obtain the, the Lagrangian we started with by from taking direct sums of symbols and um, gluing them together um, by turning on expectation values of tachyons at their intersections. So this deforms the differential away from the trivial one, which it, it would have been um, originally for the direct sum. So for example, for y, uh, which is the equivariant mirror of the a minus one surface, you get an explicit complex that describes the figure a frame. Uh, anyway, so our derived category turns out to have a second description in terms of the right symbols. So in fact, you get a pair of this, uh, descriptions of um, one in terms of the algebra a, generated by the right symbols and the other in terms of the left symbols. And the relation between them is causal duality. Now, the only important thing for us today is that among the right symbols are brains that serve as caps. And that has a striking consequence. This means that we get a second purely classical description of not homology groups, which we can read off from the description of the brain as a bound set of symbols without any further work. Everything is encoded in this description of the brain as a bound set of symbols. From the complex that describes the brain, we get for free a complex of vector spaces that the, whose different, and the action of the differential on them inherited from the maps between the, um, that, that form the complex, whose cohomology is the link homology. In fact, for construction, these vector spaces uh, 
uh, correspond to intersection points of Lagrangians. And the maps between them compute the, ag the, the action of the differential coming from instant pulses. Um, so this is how uh, this derived equivalence um, solves the not categorification problem. The differential that's constructed classically from um, the geometry of the brain sums up all the actions of the, all the actions of instantons. So we end up with, we're starting from geometry, we end up with a purely algebraic description. The resulting algebraic description, however, is far simpler than what mat mathematicians know in terms of the KRLW algebras. Um, okay, so I'm over time, so I'm not gonna show you the algebra, but um, anyway, thank you for, for listening. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's thank the speaker for a very interesting talk. And uh, something I forgot to mention at the beginning is that the, the slides um, have been posted in the chat um, and they'll also appear on the website. Um, and are there any questions? Um, so let me just check in the chat. Ah, yes. Um, Chu Chu uh, uh, Liu um, has a question. Oh, hi, uh, Nina. Hi. hi, may we see the last few slides? Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's see. So here's the algebra. <laughs> so the algebra can, has a, um, can be described geometrically as just the algebra of, um, of for SU2, as the algebra of strings uh, on a cylinder, where um, a single strict, um, so uh, for um, a single single blue string uh, describes paths on, paths on a quiver that I showed you before, on a d equal to one quiver. And more general, if you have d strings on the cylinder, um, <clears throat> you get generators of the algebra uh, for arbitrary d that you get to get um, covenant homology. So um, every string diagram is made of, of string bits. That's one of the four types which carry specific equivariant degrees and um, where the first three come from the one dimensional problem and the crossing uh, is new for higher dimension because again, the number of blue, stif of blue strings is um, the, the number of, of caps you get to have. Um, the algebra uh, multiplication is simply stacking cylinders and the relations of these. So they say that the blue strings need to be taught or the algebra element vanishes. So um, the KRL double algebra of Cohen or Lodo um, and, and others um, is similar. It has more generators and different relations. Um, it describes category of brains upstairs on the big X. And um, uh, so it's naturally more complicated. Um, the category of brains uh, on small Y and the small X are essentially portions of this algebra by setting the dots to zero. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, at least at the moment, the prescription of obtaining link invariants from the KRLW algebra seems uh, far more opaque than what I described. Perhaps because uh, originally one lacked the geometric understanding of these brains that serve as caps in the caps. Um, so, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks for asking, Liz. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I have a, a very naive question. Um, so the, do these um, new not invariants coincide with these um, invariants from the KLRW algebras? In, in, uh, yes, in so that's a theory. That's right. So the, the theorem of, of Webster says that my first approach uh, gives you the same invariants as the ones of the KLRW algebras. Uh, however, those are essentially not directly computable. You know how to compute them when you have some other way of computing them via phones or something. Mm -hmm. I think what this will lead is an approach to uh, categorification, which will be computable. Um, okay. Uh, are there um, are there other questions? <laughs>
Okay, so if not, then uh, uh, let's thank the speaker. Indeed, let's thank all uh, three speakers of uh, the afternoon session for three very interesting talks. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you very much.